Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is our second of uh, three live webinars that are part of this month's Standards Matter series. Uh, my name is Christina De Silva, and I'm a professional practice analyst here at the college, and I'll be hosting this evening's webinar. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, I just want to draw your attention to the chat box that's at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have any questions for the speaker throughout, or if you have any technical difficulties, feel free to type into the chat box, and the moderator will uh, address any technical problems that you might be having. And at the end, if there's time, we will take your questions. We'll keep track of those as we go, and then I'll be posing those questions to our uh, presenter. So February marks the launch of a bi-monthly series that focuses on each of the six standards practices. As the profession evolves, it's important to continually revisit the code and standards to ensure you understand your professional and ethical responsibilities, as well as reflect on how you're applying them in your daily practice. So we're kicking off the series uh, this month with Standard 1, a Caring and Responsive Relationships. And uh, now, <clears throat> sorry. Um, there's a dedicated Standards Matter page actually now on our website. And um, it features new resources, videos, upcoming webinar details, and more. And they're all there uh, to inspire thinking and reinforce the key elements of leadership, relationships, learning environments, pedagogical approaches, communication, and collaboration. So before we get started, I'm just going to put up a poll for the audience here. So if you could just uh, answer the question here, do you feel confident that your strategies for intervening during challenging behaviors and moments are informed by your caring and responsive relationships? Just give you a second there to answer. So it looks like most of us are somewhat or very confident about this. So that's great to hear. Keep it up for just one more second. So before I introduce Marcia, I just want to quickly revisit Standard 1, uh, which is what we're focusing on this month in February. Uh, so what we say in Standard 1 is that RECEs understand that strong, positive relationships contribute to healthy child development, and they are necessary for children's well-being and learning. Building and maintaining caring and responsive relationships with children, families, and colleagues is fundamental to our practice of RECEs. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Marcia Morgan. She's a registered early childhood educator. She's worked in the field of early childhood education for 24 years. She graduated from Cambrian College of Applied Arts and Technology and worked as a frontline educator for 15 years and is a part-time faculty in the early childhood education program at Cambrian College for eight years. Currently, Marcia is an early learning and inclusion consultant for child and community resources. Marcia is passionate about the importance of building positive relationships, belonging, and inclusion for all children. So Marcia, I'm going to throw it over to you. If you want to turn on your uh, webcam and your mic, you can take it away. Hi there, everybody. How's everyone this evening? I hope this finds you well. So we're going to begin. So what we're hoping to achieve within this webinar is at the conclusion, you'll be able to identify considerations when choosing interventions, identify best practice interventions to help calm children, and identify best practice interventions to teach children coping, social, and self-help skills. The overall intervention philosophy. So registered early childhood educators make the well-being 
learning, and care of children their foremost responsibility. They value the rights of children and create learning environments where all children can experience a sense of belonging and inclusion. Registered early childhood educators foster children's joy of learning through child-centered and play-based pedagogy. All children deserve to experience a sense of belonging, well-being, engagement, and expression. When we think of intervention, our responses and practices must reflect and embrace these foundations. At the core of our philosophy, educators should remain focused on the importance of caring relationships as the center of our intervention. Standard one, which is caring and responsive relationships. Registered early childhood educators understand that strong, positive relationships contribute to healthy child development and are necessary for children's well-being and learning. Building and maintaining caring and responsive relationships with children, families, and colleagues is fundamental to the practice of registered early childhood educators. Now, standard 1A should be our highest priority, the priority in our daily interactions with children, family, and colleagues. Keeping this standard at the forefront of our minds guides us in being authentic and kind in our interactions. This type of leadership provides concrete and direct examples to children on what healthy relationships should look like. If we want to put a stop to bullying, this begins with us and our daily interactions and the examples that we set in the way we treat one another. And that starts within our early learning and child care environments. So intervention, exactly what is intervention? It's an action taken to improve a situation. So I want you to reflect for a moment. Do the strategies that you currently use with the children in your professional supervision help and or calm the children. So often the strategies that we choose can inadvertently trigger children, making the situation tougher than it needs to be. Are we supporting new skill development? And it's really important to remember that when we're looking at skill development, it's not just about what makes it more convenient on us as the early childhood educators. It's really about what's going to be most impactful to the child and what they're going to have true value for through their lens. Does it help them to learn what to do versus simply providing a consequence? So remember that strategies that involve the adult taking control of the situation can often lead to power struggles, especially with toddlers and young preschoolers who are programmed to assert their independence. Remember that nobody wins in a power struggle. This is completely uh, developmentally appropriate for toddlers and young preschoolers. And do our strategies improve the situation or do they trigger certain children? And it's something that we need to keep in mind because remember, intervention is an action taken to improve a situation. So if we're triggering children, are we improving upon that situation? So with that being said, how do we redirect challenging behavior and make the situation better? So some considerations before choosing intervention strategies. We want to remember that the environment is the third teacher. So the environment needs to be rich in learning opportunities that really pique their interest. Um, educators should be present for supportive serve and return interactions. And for those of you who are familiar with the behavior practice guidelines, that serve and return interaction um, really, um, really is about being present and seeing the child initiations and then responding either by imitating or imitating and adding and looking for the response and really building that back and forth in that way. Um, having the knowledge of the child from a holistic sense and, fam and their family dynamics and working in collaboration and harmony with other colleagues, supporting each other throughout the day. Now I'm not going, going to go into a whole lot of detail about the first three bullets, uh, because I feel that most of you will have a very good sense of that, um, of that, educate, uh, that uh, expectation. But I do want to take a moment to discuss the fourth bullet, and it's really about working in collaboration with your team members. It's imperative that our early childhood educator teams work together to support one another, especially in times of challenge. Although children are normally assigned to one core educator, children are part of the entire early learning environment. Therefore, it becomes everyone's responsibility to provide support, particularly when there are challenges. The more support educators receive from their colleagues, 
the more likely they will be to be responsive to the feedback and choose strategies with confidence. And that's really what we want to be doing for one another is really building confidence in one another so that these challenging moments are just that, their moments. Um, and I really want you to think about the people that you work with. Um, each and every one of us as a registered early childhood educator all possess our own unique qualities. And within these unique qualities, we'll all have our own experiences that can really lend themselves uh, to perhaps um, helping educators see things in a new light. Uh, so if you see a fellow educator struggling, um, don't be shy about approaching them in a supportive way and saying, you know, I've been through this. Here's something that really helped me throughout that time. It's just something that you might want to try. Um, it's a really good opportunity for you to take some leadership uh, just within your own centre. Perspectives of challenging behaviour. Registered early childhood educators will interpret and define challenging behaviour differently. So while it is often a matter of perspective, Challenging behavior can be defined as actions that interfere with the child's ability to positively participate in activities, interactions, and transitions throughout the day. Some potential reasons uh, children present challenging behavior. So number one, they've learned by doing certain things that they get what they need. Now children will exhibit challenging behavior to obtain attention, escape a task or activity that is not desirable to them, to escape or gain sensory stimulation, or to obtain a tangible item. So this can be food, this can be a favorite toy. Um, strategies must be chosen that will not maintain that behavior. So it's really important to spend the time really getting to know the children under your professional supervision and really find out what motivates them because really what motivates them is really going to end up being your answer, but in a proactive way. They might be missing the skills needed to be successful. So children will exhibit challenging behavior or no action at all if they lack the skills they need to do it in the first place. Imagine how it would be to not be able to do what you've been asked to do, and then someone gets upset with you. Okay, just some food for thought. They may not understand what they are being asked to do. So if children don't understand the direction and think about all of our little peanuts who might be struggling with that domain of communication, all right, they may not speak English. Um, what you're asking them to do might be completely new to them. Um, but if they don't understand the direction, it will become more difficult for them to carry out the task. Imagine being asked to complete a duty related to your work that you didn't understand and then your coworker becomes angry when it's not done. All right, that would be really tough. They may be overtired, hungry, not feeling well, or simply need a break. Demands may be too high and reinforcement may be too low. All of these factors will make children handling everyday stressors more challenging. Also, consider the impact that a move in household, the birth of a sibling, addition of a household member, and other familial changes can impact on our little ones. The other thing that I'd really like you to reflect on is to think about the interactions that you have on a day-to-day -day basis with the children uh, in your professional supervision. How many demands are being placed versus how many good, rich, quality serve and return interactions are happening? And very often that's a good place for us to reflect because when the demands are really high, um, sometimes it can leave really little room for children to really get what they need in terms of attention from us to begin with. Um, so it's a very simple place to really reframe what we are doing and spend a little bit more time in that interactive piece versus that directional piece. So seeing it through a child's lens, What's causing the challenging behavior? Take a moment and just look at the different ideas. Right? What's the current situation? Are there some contributors? Is it stress behavior or misbehavior? And again, for those of you who are very familiar with our behavior practice guidelines, you'll know that we're being challenged to really, rather than looking at challenging behavior as misbehavior, but stress behavior. 
um, what do they normally respond to positively? Think about unique children. What are their individual stressors? Are there certain times of the day that might be more difficult? And are there opportunities for learning? What might be a teachable moment? And these are times where we really need to become stress detectives and seek to discover what current events in a child's life that might be contributing to the observed behavior that we are seeing. So what's contributing to the current situation? We want to make sure that we continue with our responsibility to communicate with children and families by being equitable, inclusive, and respectful of diversity. We need to be receptive listeners and offer encouragement and support by responding appropriately to ideas, concerns, and needs of children and families. So what's contributing to the current situation? Consider other events occurring in a child's life outside the early learning environment. And we are just talking about a change in household, um, perhaps a change in family dynamics, somebody moving in, somebody leaving the household, the birth of a sibling, a family illness. So all of these factors, just as they affect us as adults, they affect our, our precious little people in that same way. We want to make sure that we're taking time to connect with families and really listen non-judgmentally. Um, we do have families that, um, despite their best efforts, um, might be experiencing a great deal of chaos. And when that's occurring, the last thing that we want to be doing um, is re-traumatizing the family by passing judgment. So remember, we want to be there as a very supportive individual who perhaps can even decrease the stress of the family just by responding and, and listening non-judgmentally. And, and this hopefully is going to help us with our response based on the child situation. You know, it really helps us to give us a bit of a lens on what might be happening. So many children will have other events occurring in their lives other than just what's occurring in the early learning environments. Taking that time to connect with families will definitely give you some of that uh, direction that you need. Um, and information to make the best decisions that you can um, with the support of individuals within your environment. So when you are aware that children have changes in their lives that might be difficult for them, make sure to take some time with them doing what they enjoy. And that's really important because when you partake uh, in play that's really led by the child, very often they get a sense of, you get me you understand me, and it really increases that connection that uh, perhaps was already there, but it will even build on it more so. And it really demonstrates that you are there with them. Now with younger children, and I mean even when we're talking infants and toddlers, simply repeating activities that they really enjoy, specific songs, nursery rhymes, you know, or social games like peekaboo, even something that simple. Um, actions that the child responds to with enthusiasm, even imitating what they, do, uh, what they do can be really great relationship builders. And when a child has a strong relationship with their educator, they're much more likely to be motivated to respond positively. They see their educator as a giver of good things. Now this also empowers the educator to be able to calm the child more readily when that needs to occur. So potential stress causes for a child, and let's think about these throughout the day because these can even be stressors for us. Transition times, uh, whether they're planned or, or whether it's something that happens suddenly, um, like a fire alarm, um, specific activities, um, you know, especially for our little, um, our little ones that have a hard time sitting for long periods. So those times can be especially difficult. Meal times. Sleep room, believe it or not, can be very difficult on some individual children and special events that perhaps they're not accustomed to. Um, so we really want to think about the individual children in our care. What are the individual stressors that you know they have? What are the experiences that tend to be aversive to them? And if a stressor is being identified that was not a stressor in the past, we might then want to be asking ourselves, why is it a stressor now? What has changed that perhaps has made this event become a stressor for the child? So a few things to think about, especially when we're able to identify stressors for individual children. 
Um, some of you may be familiar with something called a time-in strategy. And a time-in is something that we are doing as a proactive strategy. So when we know something is a stressor, we want to physically be there for the child in a way that's very positive to them. We want to respond in a way that supports and calms them throughout that event. We want to take as much fear out of that situation as we can. And really that helps the child to develop trust in adults and it contributes to the development of self-regulation. When a registered early childhood educator spends time with a child specifically during times that they recognize their stressors as an effort to calm the child and guide them through the process as positively as possible, that helps the educator become what's called a buffer to the child and really decrease that amount of stress, which we know, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, um, long-term uh, stress and distress for a child can really become derailing to their development. Now, we are all very aware that sometimes that can be easier said than done. And some children might be in distress for a little while, and that can be really difficult for us as the educators as well. A strategy you may want to use is some deep breathing. So when we do deep breathing, it has a physiological connection to calming. It helps reduce our, our heart rate and it supports both us and then the child within our care. So something that you may want to remember is the interplay that happens within an interaction. Um, when we respond, um, our response can make uh, an event for somebody better or worse. Um, when we take that deep breath and we're taking that moment to be really introspective um, and having that check-in about where we are, um, we're helping to calm the situation by not escalating it and adding further stress to the situation. At the same time, we're also role modeling a really important strategy for our little ones. And you might notice when you take that deep breath, um, sometimes as they're looking at you, especially if they've got a really strong relationship, they'll also start taking that deep breath. And sometimes that's the first step to really calming that situation. And it's a very simple strategy to use. Now, other strategies can be used are things like visuals when tasks are presented, especially when it's a task that's very difficult for an individual to really break down the steps and really take the anxiety out of the difficulty of that task. It might be with us modeling the completion of the request and completing the task together then the child might not feel so alone and it might give them a greater understanding of what the expectation was to begin with. We might also want to try setting limits. And when we say setting limits, it can be providing two or three options of how a task can be completed. And I actually saw this completed beautifully by an educator who was in the middle of um, a potential escalation with a SAC child who really didn't want to go on a field trip. Part of the reason he was responsive is she already had some background information about a traumatic event he had had um, when he had previously been um, on a field trip to the same destination. And she presented it so beautifully to him because she did not put any weight on the choices. She said very simply, there's three ways that you can get on the bus. You can get on by yourself. You can choose any friend you like and they can be your partner for the day you can choose to be my partner. And if you want to be my partner, you are more than welcome to carry the clipboard and be the leader. And I thought the way she presented it made all the difference because there was no weight in the choice that he took. And I thought it was a true testament of her relationship with the child because he chose to be her partner in the end. And she did reinforce it by providing him that opportunity to be that leader. And what really could have taken 10 to 15 minutes and been very stressful on that child, really ended up taking 30 seconds of her time in, in just a lot of um, a lot of real intent with the way she worded it to keep him calm and focused. If you feel at the end of this that you have exhausted all of your options and you've tried what you've known and you can really feel that you are becoming stressed yourself and it's not helping the situation, no, number one, we are all human. And we have all of our own personal events that you know can contribute to that happening. But think about switching out with another team member who can provide a fresh lens on the situation and attempt a new approach on the situation. And you know, when we do that check-in with, with ourselves, it, it doesn't say that we've been unsuccessful. Really what it says is we've done as much as we can, and now we're just going to try and take another crack at it in a different way. 
And I, I think it, it says a lot about individuals who are able to identify that within themselves. And it equally says just as much about your team members when they say, hey, you know what? You've done all that you can. Let, let's take a break and I'll take that now for you. Okay, so some things to consider if, you, if it's not something that's already uh, part of your repertoire. So something else that we want to remember with our unique relationships with children is what does a child normally respond to positively? So let's think about physical supports such as uh, soft touches, hugs, rubbing their backs or holding them. And a really important thing to remember is physical sh support should always be kept positive and it should be adapted based on the age and the developmental stage of the child. We also want to remember that individual children respond to affection in different ways. So we want to be really looking for what do they find calming and let's stick to that. Some children like you just sitting next to them and for that, for them that's enough. We might want to ask what they need if they can verbalize it or communicate by pointing. Um, and although sometimes that can be tough with um, younger children, um, it does give them the opportunity to try and let you know what they need. A lot of the time, children do know what it is they want or they need, and it really empowers us to give them an appropriate response if we've taken that time to find out. Now, something to note is we can very often see signs of anxiety um, very early on in children before uh, behavior really becomes challenging. Um, and really, um, anxiety can be defined as a change or increase in behavior. Some things that you might see, whether the child is very young or a sack child, is you might see some faint crying, some whimpering, some pacing, some staring, some moving away from the group, or there might be a request for attention. Okay? These are all potential signs that a child is already anxious, and this is a really great time for us to become very supportive because it's our supportive approach that's going to help decrease that feeling of anxiety because they will see us as supporting them. So something you can think about in those instances is providing a calm activity, um, something that they really, really enjoy doing, something that you find when they start, they just get engrossed in. And something that we know about children is their ability to self-regulate increases when they're highly engaged in an activity that they enjoy. So when we know children well, we're a lot more able to be able to support them in that step. They may also need our support um, in resolving a situation. Um, and this last bullet really involves registered early childhood educators providing care and support to the child in resolving situations with their peers. Help, we want to help them by hearing both sides of the story. Help them to talk it out. Now for some children, this might mean interpreting communication um, with younger children or children who have difficulty communicating and by giving them words to repeat back to their peers. We really want, to focus, we really want the focus to be on the children having time to identify their feelings and talk out a resolution rather than us providing a consequence, breaking up the play, or really taking it over on them. Remember that what we're role modeling and what we're facilitating are skills that they're going to take with them later in life to be able to resolve conflicts. Um, so this is a really important place that we can really support them in that learning. And I just wanted to do a bit, a bit of a check-in. Did we have a poll question for midway through? Or is this something we wanted to do a little bit later? Okay, and it's something that we had just touched on. So how often do you collaborate with your colleagues to decide appropriate intervention strategies? And it looks like our highest numbers are coming in at very often and often, which is wonderful to see because it really means um, you're taking that time to um, pull on the leadership of others or really share your own strengths with others uh, in being able to support one another in the workplace. Have there been any questions so far that maybe should be answered or are we good to continue to move forward with uh, the remainder of the uh, webinar? Um, I think you can continue and uh, there have been a couple of questions so we can pose them at the end.
Okay, perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. So we'll talk about some opportunities for learning. So when play breaks down, and we know that this happens very frequently, especially with our preschool children and our young SAC children, um, the last thing we want to be doing is resolving this by sending children away from the activity. When we send children away from the activity, it doesn't give them much of an opportunity for them to build on those play or those social skills. So by observation or discussion, we want to really discuss what has made play break down. Um, and I want you to remember that with every challenge, there's an opportunity to teach children something new. So for example, when play breaks down, rather than assuming a child is not ready to partake in play or requires time on their own, assist them in resolving them in the conflict. Help to give all children involved a voice, and this may include giving them words to, uh, of what to say to their peers. We want to assist them in re-establishing play. Um, they learn so much through play. Uh, they develop so fully through play, and it's so important that we really assist them in keeping that going. And we want to be a part of play. We want to model play and stay engaged with the group. And it doesn't mean we're going to take over and lead it. We want to make sure that the children are leading it at all times. Um, but think about, and I mean, this is one of the most um, exciting aspects of our job, is I don't think in any other profession you get to get paid to play with kids. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to really think back when you were young and what was really fun and really move along with the group. Um, and again, for those of you who are very familiar with our behavior practice guideline, uh, Dr. Jean Clinton identifies in the College of Early Childhood Educators behavior practice guideline um, that educators shift their focus from uh, away from activities, and it doesn't mean that activities aren't being aren't happening. It means they're set up in a way that children can be more autonomous, um, but so that they're able to be present and available and engage fully with children as the moment might require. Uh, she also highlights the importance of attending and responding to children immediately when they are showing they are in need of a supportive adult. So one of the popular subjects, and as a consultant, um, I can tell you that very often we get questions about biting. And we tend to see it most of the time in toddler rooms, but it does happen sometimes in the infant rooms, and sometimes it will carry over into the toddler rooms. And a report of biting is an occurrence that will upset even the calmest of parents. So when we have a child who bites repeated, repeatedly, it really tends to be stressful in that early learning environment. So it becomes really important that we know how to respond and redirect biting as it occurs. So here's something to try. Always attend to the child that has been bitten first. All right, they've just been hurt. Give them some affection. Get them that cold compress if they need it, even if they don't need it and you were able to intervene in time and they want that cold compress. Allow them to have that. Keep an eye on the little one who has bit. And if they're a risk of going and biting again, and I know that sometimes happens, consider very gently holding their hand in a supportive way as you tend to the child that's been hurt. And again, I can't emphasize enough about that being gentle, all right? Toddlers learn off of what we are doing. So if they've been rough and we were being even the slightest bit of rough with them while they're holding that hand, um, it's going to be perceived in a way other than support, and that's not the message we want to be sending to them. Now, once the child that has been hurt is calm, we want to model for the toddler the alternative behavior that you want to see. And we are going to talk about it a little bit more, um, but this involves giving them words. I mean, if the child was taking a toy from them, tell them to say, you need to say, mine. That's something that a lot of toddlers can repeat. And it's something that unfortunately, um, sometimes we think it's negative when they say that word, when in fact, they're really trying to advocate for themselves and what they feel their rights are. Um, it might be that the child came up and was trying to initiate play and unfortunately um, took a little taste of their friend. We want to role model what gentle is. And when they repeated that behavior, we want to make sure that we verbally reinforce what it is we wanted to see to begin with. Um, and something to think about when children really want attention, okay, 
um, if we're giving them attention for the positive behaviors versus the negative, uh, um, the negative things that we see in the more challenging behaviors, they're a lot more likely to increase the positive behaviors because they want to hear that reinforcement. Now, I know a strategy that at one point was popular was timeout, and I'm going to address that now because I know there is a school of thought that still believes when children are rough that we should be sitting them out on a timeout. And I think what people need to realize is that sitting young children on a timeout provides little in learning on how to respond appropriately. Now, I'm going to add to that, timeouts teach children that we, as the educators, are in control. And it does absolutely nothing to empower the child to ask for what they need, resolve the conflict, or ask for help. So it becomes simply a consequence, but we have no proactive strategies to prevent it by building a skill with them. We want to help um, by giving children words uh, to problem solve, such as get them to say my turn, get them to say help, get them to say mine. Teaching a child to advocate for themselves empowers them to resolve problems and it sets the stage for children to feel competent and capable in managing what they need to be successful. Now do keep in mind, even with all the right strategies, Fighting is still going to happen sometimes, but when you stay consistent with those strategies, you will be teaching them the skills that they need to replace that behavior, especially if they are getting what they need quicker um, by doing what you had modeled in the first place. And so when you see it, it's really important to respond immediately and make sure that you're there to reinforce that, that by providing them what they need um, as long as it's appropriate. Now the next subject I'm going to, going to discuss is the popular, um, the popular subject of temper tantrums. And temper tantrums or escalations um, will sometimes escalate to a physical level event with some toddlers, preschoolers, and even SAC children. So one thing that we want to remember specifically with toddlers, because this is when it's the most developmentally appropriate, we want to stay firm about the boundary we've set but we still want to be calm in stating the limits. And remember that it doesn't reinforce the tantrum by staying calm and supportive in any way at all. We do want to be uh, empathetic towards the child, okay? Specifically with toddlers, our very, very young children are still developing self-regulation. So when there's something that they really, really want and they can't have it, it's heartbreaking for them. And now we're angry at them because they can't have what they want and they're upset. So sometimes just by acknowledging, you know, I know it's really hard to wait. Um, again, you're still not giving in, uh, but you're being a lot more understanding and you're definitely not feeding that escalation and that distress that that child is already experiencing. And that approach really helps to calm children early on. It also helps them to feel respected because they at least know we're hearing what's important to them. Um, it's really important to set boundaries and limits, but something that I want everybody to remember is it's not healthy for very young children to be crying for long periods of time without support. Extended periods of crying can cause uh, a release of cortisol into the brain, and if this occurs repeatedly, it can derail a child's development. So again, I know there's a school of thought that will say, you know, ignore the temper tantrum, but I want you to really carefully consider the impact that it might have on some children. If you are not giving the child what they wanted, you are creating a boundary right there. It doesn't hurt to rub their back to calm them. It doesn't hurt to be understanding. And it doesn't hurt to be patient while they work through that really, really hard moment. And I mean, think about us. I mean, even as adults, when there's something that we really wanted or really hoped for, we even need to take moments uh, sometimes to really be able to bounce back from that. Um, and we take that time with them, we're really contributing to that building of resilience um, and that building of self-regulation. And again, go back to those strategies of taking that deep breath, especially if it's been a little while that they've been crying, hoping that perhaps the child will engage in that as well. Um, now, I do want to address the fact that I know we do have children that, and again, I want everybody to remember that they are children. When we have children that um, exhibit escalations that become very physical, 
Although I know it can be very scary for us, I want you to consider what's going on through that child's lens at that moment, okay? It's important to know that we have children who have had some really traumatic experiences um, or have exceptionality. So that response sometimes, it just is not within their control at this time. So our response to this, again, can make the situation better or worse. So here are some strategies that I'd really like you to keep in mind. If you know this is a child that perhaps may throw items or might engage in some contact behavior, consider calling for help and get the other children removed from the environment. This does two things. Number one, if there was anything within the environment that was maybe triggering the escalation, it's now going to de-escalate it because it has been removed. Number two, if the child is sometimes reinforced by the attention they get during, and that's not typical of what we see, but sometimes it happens, again, you're removing that from happening and you're really decreasing the risk for everybody involved. Talk to the child calmly in a supportive way to de-escalate the situation. When children get to this level, they've lost rationality. So if we continue to place demands on them, they're not going to hear us and they're not going to remember what we have said at this time. Children are able to engage and are able to hear you once they are calm. So your focus really needs to be on calming the child and not so much on gaining control of the situation. This is a time you really want to avoid sudden movements. We don't know the story of all the children within our professional supervision. And again, we have children that are going to be in our care that may at some point in their lives have been traumatized in some way. If we are moving within their personal body space in a way that, again, they don't know what's coming, they might respond by hitting. This is a good time if you're trying to get in close to support the person. Look for those signs of anxiety. You will be able to see, again, reflecting on your relationship with the child. You'll be able to see when you've come close enough because you'll see those signs of anxiety increase. And that's where you need to stop and continue to talk very calmly from there. Once you are there, watch for signs of de-escalation. All right. When children engage in this behavior, it takes a lot of energy out of them and they cannot maintain it forever. So some of the signs that you will see are physical aspects where contact will become slower. The child might begin to cry. The child might start apologizing for the behavior. And once this physical escalation has slowed down to or stopped altogether, this is a time to use your positive relationship to reestablish communication and remember to keep it positive. Listen to what they feel happened. And this is really important because um, whether you agree with what a child is saying or not, what they feel happened is going to give you a lot of perspective on what they are experiencing and how you might want to change your response and your approach. It's also a good time to identify your feelings and concerns. I wasn't here to make you afraid. I was really worried that you were going to get hurt and I just wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, provide them with encouragement and respect. You know what? We can turn this day around. What do you need right now so we can keep moving forward? And talk about alternative solutions on how they can ask for help in the future. So ask them, before this happened, did you get a feeling deep in your stomach, um, you know, in your head? Next time you feel that, come and see me and let's talk about it. Let's see what I can do to help before you end up feeling this way. Um, and again, I know that this can be a, a really tough moment. Um, but again, if we reframe our own behavior and focus more on calming the child versus gaining control, um, we're more likely to be able to help them um, sooner on and that really helps to continue um, the integrity of the relationship because this is a little person that's coming back tomorrow. We want to make sure that that trust is there and can be reestablished. And something really big I want you to remember is responding with intent versus habit. Now when we respond in habit, um, really what we're doing is we're using strategies because we know them to work but we might not really know why we're using them in specific events. And the danger of doing that, even though some of the strategies, uh, strategies can be um, um, highly recommended, 
is there will be individual children that will not respond to them and they could make the situation worse. So we really want you approaching children in challenging behavior and stress behavior with intent as unique children. Um, think about the unique needs of the child and keep that in mind. Focus on continuing to build and maintain a connection while redirecting that behavior. Um, and it really, re really reflect on whether the strategy is working, which aspects should be continued and which should be reconsidered. And again, e even with the most seasoned educators, um, there are times what we're doing just isn't working and we have to rethink the way we are doing things in the efforts to make sure that this child is really feeling included and really getting the most out of the early learning environment and that experience that they're having with us. Above all, and this is something I'd really like everyone to remember, when children ex um, exhibit challenging behavior, remember, it's not personal, okay? It really doesn't have anything to do with us. They're not trying to make our day harder. Um, they're still learning, they're still growing, and they do that at their individual rates. And the early experiences that we provide contribute to how they respond to human interaction and the world around them later in life. So we want to make sure that we're providing a good, strong foundation by those positive relationships. And the biggest thing to remember is behavior does not define the child. Really think about the child's strengths, their interests, and find as many moments as you can to celebrate their strengths and engage them in their interests so that you can continue um, that really important relationship and, and have it continue to build in strength. Take the time in to check in with yourself. And I know that something that's um, really common to have are evenings for reflection. Reflection and introspection should happen often throughout the day. Think about things that have gone really well. And this is important because when things have gone really well, those are moments we want to repeat. What is it we did well? What were we able to pull from these individual children that just made that moment so successful when normally it was so challenging? Equally, when an interaction hasn't gone as we had hoped, we want to sit back and say, hmm, what do I need to look at here? What do I need to change? And again, this is when you have your fellow colleagues um, and sometimes your consultants to really help you out on that journey to finding what really might make an impactful change for that individual child. And focus on reflecting um, and regulating our own emotions first. And again, and again, we're all human. But we all have those moments um, on maybe days that are more stressful than others when we can really let those emotions get the best of us. Remember that those emotions really contribute to the environment. So when our emotions aren't in check, um, it's going to be really difficult to help a child um, get calm themselves. So know that sometimes you have to be able to identify that um, you yourself perhaps need to take a deep breath and need to take a moment and then we can get right back to that and help them to calming themselves um, as well. And just on a final note, um, and something to really remember, uh, the young years are fleeting uh, for these young children and they are just golden. So even though I know you're going to have those stressful moments um, and those challenging, uh, those challenging moments, focus as much as you can on enjoying the experiences that you have with them and think about what those positive interactions are going to bring to their lives um, and their future successes later on. So questions, do we have some time for some questions? Yes, uh, Marcia, we do. Thank you so much for your valuable insights. Um, the, your presentation was wonderful. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. We're running a bit over, so I'm just gonna choose two. Um, to post to you, okay? So the first one is regarding um, dealing with some, uh, or struggling with some unwanted behaviors in sort of older children. So uh, I think the age that we, we had to explore. So this person is struggling with two children in particular who um, are often swearing in the classroom. Uh, do you have any strategies to help stop this unwanted behavior? I mean, swearing is very difficult because, again, we don't control other people's behavior. Um, I think communication with the parents become really important to say, you know, this is something that we're working on, um, trying to find other language to be able to 
um, really redirect the behavior and I know that it's incredibly tough. Um, I mean, here's some, here's a few strategies that you can consider. Number one, our reaction to what the swearing is, is going to be a very big factor in when they continue it or not. Um, if we're really calling them out, um, it might actually make the behavior increase versus decrease. Um, depending on your relationship with children, and remember the importance of this, is prior to the day, you can pull them aside and have a bit of a really... <laughs> big conversation and saying, I know that some moments get tough. Um, however, some people get really upset when you use that language. Let's talk about some other language that you can use in that place. Um, and sometimes when we have that conversation ahead of time, sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes we have to monitor what situations are occurring that might trigger that to begin with. And your answer is really going to come from what is the trigger in the first place. And if you're able to find out um, what the consistent antecedent is. And, and again, an antecedent is an event that occurs before a behavior happens. Then it helps us to get some proactive strategies in place. And it might be moderating, um, monitoring the individual's um, levels just within their interactions to be able to say, you know what, how about you and I take some time for ourselves and catching them before it happens. And again, that use of that positive relationship in Let's reinforce the fact they haven't done it yet. <laughs> let's take them time, some time to do something great and let's sneak in there. I noticed that you didn't do any swearing today and I want to tell you how great that is. I'm going to take some time to communicate that with your parents tonight. Great, thank you so much. Um, so one last question and this goes back to the biting. Um, mm. So do you have any resources or tips for um, speaking with parents of the child who was bitten? So this person is saying it can be very difficult because often the parent's response uh, is due to, you know, the empathy that they have for their own child. Who yeah. So do you have any strategies for that? I think we want to reassure parents that we are taking all measures that we can to prevent it in the first place. So if a parent is venting because they're frustrated, we don't want to cut them off. We want to definitely listen and say, you know, I'm very sorry that this happened. I know it's really hard when your child gets hurt. Here are the strategies that we are trying within the particular room to try and prevent it from happening. And here's how we are supporting your child when it does happen. Um, I think keeping the conversation going is really important. Um, I think we have to remember as well when we're discussing this with parents is for the child who's the biter, it's really important that we respect their confidentiality. And even though we don't want to be necessarily normalizing the behavior, we do want to let parents know um, if you're in a situation where a parent is becoming upset because they feel it is one particular child, you're going to want to redirect that and say, you know what, certain times of the day can be really difficult on all children. We're trying to recognize what those stressors are and get there before the biting happens. Um, so I think I'm just going to ask one more question that's just come in, and it's in regards to the time out mm -hmm. strategy that you were talking about. It's not effective with younger children. What are your thoughts on using that strategy with an older set, so maybe the six to eight years? Do you think that that's appropriate, or do you have an alternative strategy to suggest? Um, I'm really going to go back to, I mean, the, the problem with timeout is all it does is exercise our own control and it really doesn't help children to recognize their own levels of self-regulation. So again, I would go back, the time and strategy is something that works, I think, with people of all ages. You know, if you notice that your coworker was having a really hard moment, would you wait until they broke down and needed to go take five minutes or would you go and you support them ahead of time and say, hey, what can I do to help, right? You'd want to do it ahead of time. So I think when we know things are coming up, you know, with children, we really need to watch what those cues might be and we want to intervene then. What again are the stressors? And I know when groups are much larger, when you have 15 children um, and there's a lot of movement, that can be a lot tougher. But I think this goes back to if something has occurred, Let's go back to some conflict resolution strategies. Let's hear from the person who was hurt first, what occurred. Let's hear from the person who did the hurting. There's likely a reason that it happened. They might be able to verbalize it. 
And if they're able to verbalize it, what can we help them with? Because again, even in the six to eight range, these children are still learning. Um, and depending on what the background of the child can be, it can be really tough. So if all we're doing is putting them on timeout, it's just not teaching them the appropriate skills that they need later on to be successful. Great, thank you so much. And Marcia, on behalf of the College of ECEs and all of our RECs who joined us tonight, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. Um, and to everyone who has joined us, thank you as well for taking time out of your evening to come and learn from uh, Marcia this evening. Um, so we are going to be posting this webinar on the College's YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you have found this information valuable um, and you want to share with your colleagues, please encourage them to go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and they can check out the, um, the webinar tomorrow. Thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity. You're welcome. Um, and also for those of you who shared your email with us, uh, we will be emailing the link directly to you, um, so you don't need to necessarily go and search it on YouTube. You'll have it there for you. Um, and the Standards Matter series does continue next week. So keep that in mind. The next webinar will be on Tuesday, February the 27th at 7 o'clock. And it will feature Dan Blackhall, RECE. He's the Director of Program Development Earlier Professional Development Center. And the topic will be on anticipating and preventing challenges. Uh, so we'd like to encourage you to get involved with us here at the college. Um, if you're interested, you can always put your name forward to be uh, a member of council or even to sit on one of our committees, and it will help you with advancing your leadership skills. And feel free to follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel throughout the year. And always do check out our website, college-gte.ca, for all of our latest news. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening.